Hey guys, welcome to this episode of MSP Mindset, where if you change your mindset, you change your team's lives and your life. I have the gift and the pleasure of speaking with uh, Giovanni Sangilli today, and I could go on and on about um, the things that he's done, but I want to spend more time talking with him, so I'll try to limit it, but he's the founder and CEO of Glass Hive, co-founder of TriDigital, uh, works with MSPs across 15 countries, uh, but a couple of things, you know, he's got a lot of interesting things. I'm going to try to pull out the ones I think are more interesting personally. Um uh, He's generated, helped generate 384,000 leads that ended up in over 1.2 billion, that's with a B, in MSP revenue. Uh, one of his companies currently has 15,000 MSPs. Um, now, that sounds really cool. Hopefully that, that lets you understand. You might understand a few things, but his first MSP, he was just brought on to help migrate from break fix to managed services. So if he started there, uh, he probably knows a little bit about it, at least from my perspective. Turns out Intel and Microsoft, a couple of small companies, bought that company. Uh, that ended up becoming some version of MSP University. And his job was to hand off the contracts and help evangelize the MSP model and help with sales and marketing. So to this day, it seems that he's really passionate about that. Um, and then lastly, what I think is way cool is used to work. he used to work at D.C., as a comic book artist. So uh, with no further ado, welcome Giovanni. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Glad to be here. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. This is this is so exciting for me. So let's get into, so we're going to cover a couple things today, guys, mostly around how the heck we can be differentiated as MSPs. I was talking to one in Colorado, and he was saying there's 275 of us that say the same thing in the metro area. So um, so I, we're very fortunate. Uh, this really seemed to resonate. Um, so if a couple things, some of you guys are listening later. If you're live, take advantage of that. Hit us with questions. We'll take as many as we possibly can get. We had so much interest that people started writing questions in before the show ever went live. And so, uh, so we're going to get into your questions. We're going to talk about how to make your MSP unique, common, common objections, and that sort of thing. Before we get into that fun stuff, a little side story I wanted to ask about is, tell me about how you ended up with a really cool comic behind you, how you ended up working at DC as a comic book artist. Like that's, maybe I'm crazy. That's not the norm for an MSP. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, so as long as I can remember, I was, you know, loved art and I loved drawing. I started drawing Disney, you know, of course as a kid and, as I got older, my interest grew from uh, that to kind of anime, and then uh, I got really into comics and uh, just worked on my craft. And, um, you know, I submitted my portfolio to every company to try to get, you know, a job into in any field of art. But specifically, um, I got a call back from DC Comics and I got to. Uh, work there and and start off as an inker where you're basically just doing the ink work over a director's drawings and i was just having the greatest time of my life it's like you know just drawing uh comics for a living it doesn't make a good living you know it's making like 12 grand a year or something like that because they pay you by the page or the panel um and you need a lot of hand speed and be able to do a lot of panels in order to make a good living and you kind of have to grind it out you know, so you can become a director and make uh, some serious money there. But super fun uh, company to work for, super big passion of mine. And um, I need another job at the same time. And that was a blessing in disguise because I landed at an MSP. They needed help <laughs> migrating their customers from uh, break, fix, and managed services. And I've mm. been in the channel ever since. This is my new home. Yeah. Um, so but I still get do drawing. That. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I want to get into that, but tell me about the Batman comic. Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> in 2000, you know, uh, we were working on a big comic. It was actually outsourced. So a lot of us, you know, you kind of treat like contractors. You work on a lot of different drawings and different things. And Batman needed a facelift. So what they did was they hired the studio that Jim Lee was working for. Um, it was, he wasn't a part of DC yet. He's the C, uh, chief creative officer now, 
But at the time, he was really known for making X-Men very popular. So he's the one that gave Wolverine the yellow costume and redefined the X-Men and created Gambit and all those different types of things to make that comic successful. So they came to him with an idea and said, hey, we need to make a, a comic, a Batman comic to um, bring it back and kind of make a big splash. So we got together to create um, – you know, a comic that would kind of incorporate all the villains. Uh, and back in 2006, that comic is Hush. So I got to play a role in that. And uh, just, you know, one of those super successful things, you never know how it's going to pan out. Um, but it became a really great selling comic and uh, had a lot of fun. It was a pleasure to be a part of. So I think you're being humble, but if I understand it right, I don't ever state it, but it sounds like you actually got a hand in drawing or redrawing batman for this particular yeah case. yeah so of course yeah so not only that but all the other characters that were on of course batman is the main character but um right here next to me are some of the drawings from um yeah let's see that, that here so here's some of the scenes this is where um superman's fighting batman um batman is superman's being controlled by poison ivy is that your draw? And, is that hand drawn? Yeah. So these are these are reprints of it. These panels are actually much larger, but this is the ink work. Yes, all hand drawn. Um, uh, later, digitally colored um, by the colorist. But there's a lot of notes and stuff on this, as you can tell, of different things that we're thinking of as we're planning out the different scenes. But. Um, mm. You know, all the credit in the world to Jim Lee, who directed the whole thing and created the, you know, the full idea and and character designs for everything. And he's like my idol. So that's just, you know, we went to Buca de Beppo to eat. <laughs> and, you know, they always take pictures like, hey, you want to buy a picture? I was the one that's like, yes, please. I, like, I'll buy this one right now. <laughs> Never let it go away. So later on, I'll post a link to the picture and everything uh, for it. But really, yeah. really cool, guys. Uh, the don't the DC animated universe created a version of it, but they changed the villain. I recommend you guys just pick up the comic book and read it, and I think it's much better than the animated film adaptation they made a lot uh, a while later. Yeah, actually, reading the comics is a lost art now. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be cool to share that. So, how did you go from starving comic book artist or or, or twelve thousand dollar year comic book artist to uh, MSP. How'd, how'd that happen? So I, I needed, a, I needed a job, you know, I was doing all kinds of jobs, anything I could do, uh, to, you know, to, to make additional money. Um, we had a tragedy in the family. My mother, uh, was a victim of violent crime. So when oh, I was yeah. a teenager, 16, she was killed and me and my brother had to figure out how to get through life. We had, my sister was 11 years old. Um, and my brother was just really good at, you know, getting jobs at a variety of different places through people he knew or friends from high school. And we did everything from doing loans during the real estate bubble and all that kind of stuff on the side. But a friend of his was ended up working at, a, at an MSP, Intelligent Enterprise, and said to my brother, hey, we're looking to build a sales team. We need to migrate our, our break fix customers into a flat rate all you can eat model. I'm like, I didn't even know there's it companies. I thought it was a guy that would like her or girl, right. They would come in and just fix your computer. But, um, sure. I was like, yeah, do anything for, for a starter career, any, any job you have, I'll do it. And I, so we started working there and I was just fascinated, um, by the way that they can, you know, these MSPs or this company was solving problems for businesses through technology. So what I did was I, I, you know, I was told to make 300 dials a day and just start calling and help, you know, do the sales process. And we had this whole pitch and the president over there, Gary Beach, did a really good job of that. But uh, what I ended up doing was I was really fascinated by the technology and wanted to understand more, you know, about it, how it worked and what it was solving problems. So fun story. I, I actually um, sat there. And I drew my very first white paper. I didn't even know it was marketing. I was just the, – the CIO was on the whiteboard explaining virtualization to me, okay? He drew a pie chart on the whiteboard. He's like, imagine this is a server's resources, okay? 
And we are going to divide these resources to act as multiple servers, okay? And this is all made possible how you, you can chop up these resources and create virtual machines within one machine. So they don't need the file server app server. It can be consolidated into the server through virtualization on the hypervisor. And I'm like just drawing all this and explaining that, you know, and writing kind of like a brief around it. And I designed that that piece and I was sending it out to all the customers that were on my lead list. I didn't realize at the time either that that was spam. <laughs> you shouldn't do that, <laughs> but but that's the way that's the way we did it, and that's how I got calls back, man. And then I just started to learn more and more about the technology, and then they're like, "Hey, you, what you're doing is marketing. Here's the right way to do it, where you're not spamming people." And um, I evolved eventually becoming the VP of Sales and Marketing for that company. So that's a crazy story. I remember <laughs> yeah. the days making a hundred plus dollars a day whatever it took. I also remember trying to, I was the one trying to explain virtualization and drawing, but I am not a comic book artist or skilled in drawing at all. So my <laughs> virtualization drawings are probably paled in comparison to yours. So <laughs> now I need to find the Giovanni Sengilli originals of uh, virtualization drawings. So. <laughs> I mean, we got to get with, we got to get with Eric. He's got to have them somewhere. And this yeah. funny thing, if you ever interview him, man, dude, he, he's, I, I used to go into their office and just ransack everybody's whiteboard and just draw stuff for everybody all the time. Um, I was still actively doing all that stuff. So it was, it was really funny, but yeah, you know, it's funny, man. I, you're making the dials a day. I have a backup story for you on that. So okay. we were, the big thing was transitioning off the of tapes. Cause that was our, 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 our lead in Zenith Infotech had the backups the mm -hmm. offside backups in the, in the sand, uh, oh, yeah. uh, the NAS, sorry, that we put on site. So we called and I'm like, hi, I'm your Microsoft certified partner in the area. And we're calling because of a common problem we found with accounting firms. Like what? It's like, yeah, a lot of accounting firms are using tape backups to back up and they're finding that it's failing 70% of the time at time of restore. And it's typically due to because, you know, how they're managing the tapes, you know, some mm -hmm. people take them in their car and, I would lead with that. And they thought I was calling with from Microsoft and like, right. yeah, you know what? They're like, you're like, you're like, what do you mean? I do tape backups. I'm like, yeah. So are you testing them periodically to make sure they work? No. Right. It's like, well, right. heat's another big thing that damages and compromises the tapes. Are you storing them anywhere where it's hot? It's like, they're in my car. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you want to see things like that, man, from like, you know, of course, those are smaller accounting shops, but like, you know, even the bigger ones just had a mess, you know, as you know, it's still the same thing today, um, with people managing their IT, but that's, was our way in. And I just never forget that script of making those amount of dials and just leading in with that. It's funny. Anybody that's ever had to make those kind of dolls to get going that won't forget like that, uh, that, that kind of beginning, I feel like. Yeah. So that's yeah, funny. They yeah. thought you were with Microsoft. Um, yeah. And, uh, and Microsoft certified partner in the area. What's yeah, Microsoft want, man? They're calling over here. But I, I was there just like, Hey, almost like a survey call. You know, I'm just here to, this like problems affecting, you can ask you a couple questions. If everything's good, then we're good. No problem. And during that, you convert it to be like, well, I'm worried now. I have my backup. Hey, don't worry. You know what? We can just offer a free backup assessment. If you're that worried about it, I can have someone from our company go out there and make sure to test everything. You should be fine. But mm -hmm. that was how it set appointments, you know? Nice. And, uh, <laughs> nice. you know, and that was kind of where the genesis of it all, I guess. So speaking of backups, we were talking in the green room, and it, it sounds like you had a particularly interesting story or two, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing, Giovanni. Yeah, I have a, a couple of these backup stories, man. Um, <laughs> I'll start. I'll start with my own. So you know, we've all got it, them. It's just, you know, it's funny because I, I feel bad. You know, I go out sometimes. They hire me to speak at events and do things, and then here I am running my own business. You know, and I believe in managed services, and I'm going to have a robust technology infrastructure and management of it all. And I thought I was very smart. Clearly, yeah. I'm not. You know, I know of engineering things and somewhat technical over the years, but definitely not, you know, a brilliant uh, CIO or anything like that. Right. But I'm like, look, our, our, our data backup is really important. 
because as a marketing agency, a lot of uh, services we did were video, right? So we would actually fly out and you cut, a lot of our customers can remember this and just film their office and film their location and film shots around the city and all those things. And uh, all that footage was captured in 4K and they're very large file sizes. So our strategy, you know, we can never go fully in the cloud with that stuff. At the time, the bandwidth can support some of these file sizes. So we needed to have a NAS on site and a SAN on site, which is our media server, which we would, you know, work off of the SSDs on the active files and some of the cult, older stuff was on colder storage and, you know, spinning hard drives and all, all the rest. And this whole orchestration of our backups were done. And we also had an offsite option as well. We thought we were fancy and it was costing us a little bit over $3,000 a month to, to manage just the backup portion of our business. Um, and I didn't check the basics, man. The basics will kill you. And um, the service provider, one of the naming names was backing up our data, was backing up the drive to the same drive. Mm. So that drive failed. Boom. It's all gone. And these are things, man, like we were able to recover some of it through the offsite stuff, but think about those business trips, those flights, all those hours of footage, you know, uh, going out to customer locations all over the world. We went to a couple of different countries too, to collect some of that stuff. Some of our clients that were in um, Canada or the Bahamas or South America, just, you know, so I learned my own lesson there to don't forget the basics of when, you know, you're managing your service provider and testing the backups and all the things that I've been telling customers at the start of my career. I didn't do for myself. So that was a humbling experience. Yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the more you get sophisticated, sometimes the easier it is to leave out the steps you used to do. Right. Um, yeah. Overcomplication is not a good thing. Man. It's yeah. not a good thing. It's yeah. not a good thing ever. You know? Um, but you know, that's one, but it happens to everybody, you know, like the most infamous one, one of my favorite backup stories ever uh, you guys can read the full detail of it in the book Creativity Inc. written by Ed Catmull, the founder of Pixar. When they were uh, making Toy Story 2, okay, they had a lot of issues with that movie. Number one is there was a different team working on it. By the time it was ready to come out, uh, it was really bad. The originals of the founders and the executive team were like, we can't release this movie. Steve Job goes, does the hurrah speech, tells everybody we're going to work countless hours, we're going to work around the clock, and we're going to make this, you know, Pixar worthy, and we're going to we're going to land on our feet because we need to make Toy Story too great. And there was a lot of issues that happened during that crazy burnout period where people were working literally around the clock. There were stories of babies being left in the car just because the parents, both parents, worked at Pixar and they just were so exhausted they forgot to drop them off at daycare. That's detailed in the book. But one thing that oh, wow. happened was they had a big server crash and they lost all of their data for the movie like two months when it needed to be ready for production, right? Or something like that. And and what ended up happening was a company, a, a person that was so exhausted from working broke company policy and took one of their high-powered machines home they had a full copy of the movie so just when they thought it was all lost here's this you know unorthodox right uh backup strategy of a, of an off-site copy of the movie that's there she saves a day and saves pixar and if you go to pixar's facility that actually machine is still framed <laughs> that's, that's what saves the company but yeah, it's really cool. And you guys can read the full details of it in the book. It's a great book, by the way, great business book about being unique and everything. But um, Creativity Inc., you should do it. You should. Uh, well, I definitely. posted that in the comments for any of you guys watching. There's a link there. Um, and we'll, uh, or on, in the video, I should say, we'll, we'll share that in the comments, Creativity Inc., for the full story. So that hopefully is not the backup strategy of a company, of an employee <laughs> violating backup. But... That's where you should praise them. And it's awesome that they have the machine framed because saving yeah. Pixar, saving the company, that's quite the, <laughs> quite the feat. Where would we be without finding Nemo as adults, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Can totally yeah. relate yeah, to, mm -hmm. to Dory. 
Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so uh, yeah, that's super cool. Well, you, you got me on this. I got so many more questions I want to ask, but I do want to just since you brought it back up, um, kind of make a quick segue and mention that this uh, episode is sponsored by Servosity. So Servosity Safe, what we do is we manage your backups. So if you want to think of us as an MSP for MSPs, you want to think of us as a SOC for backups, there's only two things that we do differently in my view. Number one is we manage the backups. So no more babysitting the backups. Let our expert team uh, monitor them, test them, proactively fix them, even do recoveries if you'd like. Secondly, testing. Testing is at the core. I was an MSP that lost data because I lacked the people and process to test. Testing is not optional in what we do. It's built in daily, weekly, monthly, and quarterly. So if you're at all interested in what we do, you'd just like a copy of my process that I'll be happy to give you for free that you could really use with any tool. Um, visit servocity.com slash call and um, you'll land on a form that'll allow you to just have a quick one-on-one -on -one conversation um, with me, the founder of Servocity. If you could uh, take the process and make your backups one step better, then I have succeeded. So Giovanni, as we dig in more, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how, how you got fired up. And, it, you know, at some point, this company that you started off just making cold calls for ends up, you know, in kind of Intel and Microsoft hands, and then you're evangelizing the MSP model. And uh, as I understand it, to correct me if I'm wrong, this is, this is part of, sounds like foreshadowing or your origin story, uh, given what we're talking about for why you're so passionate about today. So how, how did, tell me a little about that, that transition. Yeah, you know, so the, I wasn't an owner in the company or anything, but, you know, I, I had a high role there and um, the company I, I loved and was passionate about. I got my start in this channel that I love so much. Um, but the next step was part of the whole process was to build an association uh, to teach MSPs how to build uh, an MSP practice, right? And that was MSP University. So I had the unique opportunity to uh, travel the world, right? We started in North America. Uh, just U.S. and Canada, but ended up being over 15 countries, helping MSPs build their managed services practice. And my expertise was in uh, marketing and sales. I would help them understand how to overcome the objections, how to, you know, all the, all the questions and objections of the sales process associated with taking their break fix customers and converting them to be uh, all you can managed services customer. Um, or just going out and procuring and securing net new business, you know, people that had break fix relationships with other customers and you wanted to market them and win their business over. So, you know, there was a lot of that process of helping them with their messaging instead of benefiting from your business pain, we want to share in your success. And there was a lot of, of things I did and worked with a lot of companies that were doing some really amazing things, really creative, wonderful companies. Uh, and was able to help them just with the advice that I had and, and my feet on the ground experience to build uh, great marketing and great sales uh, operations within their company to help them grow their businesses, you know. And I look around now, you know, and we were just one company doing it. But, of course, ConnectWise and Arnie did his thing and mm -hmm. Arlen Sorensen, you know, and we were part of HGG1. He did his thing to contribute. And Able, I think, was the first vendor that came in um, with the RMM platform available for MSP. So it's just awesome to, to be a part of all that, you know, and, and to help the companies have helped uh, to this day. So I still continue to do it. I'm passionate about it. Um, and I'll do it as long as I can, as long as I'm healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know we've got a lot of questions to get to, but tell me sure. how that led to what you're doing today and just, you know, the, the high level of what, what you're doing today, because you're doing a couple of things. It sounds like. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, after, after doing the road shows for, you know, and, and just going out and doing these boot camps that we're doing at MSP or doing this on-site consulting, um, for six years, I ended up having, um, my, uh, I was about to have my first baby, my wife. So I wanted to be around for that and I couldn't be traveling as aggressively as I was. So I took a job at Intel, um, where I, I was a VP of marketing for them. And 
while that was okay, it was, it was, um, you know, Intel was a, a great career thing and a great learning experience. It was just a lot slower pace than working uh, at a small business and helping small businesses. So the impact was just night and day. But then I had a lot of people that I had met with over my traveling career that just needed help still on the side. Like, I said, hey, Gio, I need help. Can you create this marketing piece for me? Or can you help me with this marketing campaign? Or can you help me train my salespeople? And I said, sure. You know, the big thing about corporate America is you have a lot of extra time on your hands. So mm. I had some time on my hands to, to, to do it. You know, I was used to working longer hours and more fast paced. So I got with my business partner, Richard, and I said, hey, Richard, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to write the content uh, and I'll do all the consulting and all the on-site training, but I need you to help me with the content creation part of it. And we started Try Digital, which is a marketing agency um, out of my home garage there. And that business grew very quickly. I, very, I was very fortunate. Like I said, I worked with thousands of MSPs all over the world. So I had almost an existing customer base to tap into. And that let, allowed me to leave Intel to pursue my own business. Um, nice. And we did custom creative services and I got to leverage my passion around art that I never lost love for. And it was able to apply with my business knowledge and create amazing things to help MSPs differentiate themselves. And that business, I was always looking to innovate and do things. And I built a web-based application um, that was basically a data aggregator that allowed me to take all these third party tools that I was using to execute their marketing and put all the data in one place. So they had, it was called the marketing HUD heads up display where you can see all your analytics and everything around how your overall marketing is performing. And we had it integrated with ConnectWise and Autotask and that whole thing just uh, was a big boom for our business. We had hundreds of customers that joined as a result of seeing just that. And their input and their feedback of wanting a better technology platform and a better experience to support them and accelerate, enable them from a sales and marketing perspective, the way that the PSA and all these other tools, right? Like some of these new tools like P and everything else that enable them to be better service delivery professionals and help with their realization rate, utilization rate. They wanted the same thing, but to help their sales and marketing people be perform better, have automations, be more efficient and be more utilized and realized. And that was the birth of glass hive. I decided to take that project on from the ground up and, uh, it, we launched in beta November of 2019. And today we have over 15,000 MSPs across 29 countries. And it's just, man, it is super awesome to see this kind of growth there and, and, and what these MSPs are doing. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. That is a really cool story. Um, so from making, uh, comics to making cold calls to <laughs> making software for, for uh, making MSPs. software, make uh, everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is quite the, tr quite the journey there. Um, I, I want to, I have a ton of questions I want to ask you, but I want to take a few that we've gotten. Um, so sure. we've got, uh, first one, maybe an easier one, but I just love to get your take on it since you've had yeah. so much experience from Joe Pierce. He says, what are your suggestions for overcoming gatekeepers and objections? So that, that may have been take you back to your cold calling roots, but, uh, <laughs> my guess is you've had a little experience with that. Yeah. Um, um so, you know, the, the thing is you have to remember that the gatekeeper, a lot of people like to blow past the gatekeeper. Um, but they're your advocate. They're your arbiters of all the information uh, within that company. They can get you in touch with any with anyone you want to talk to. They can give you a lot of inf they can give you a lot of detailed information about the company and their technology infrastructure and just their operations in general. So, like I said, a lot of people want to get past the gatekeeper. Um, my first thing is to sell the gatekeeper and help them understand. And that's a difficult thing to do because the gatekeepers are going to be annoyed in dealing with one of many calls. Um, so the warm up process of starting with something light humor, asking them how they're doing, how things are going, almost as if you know them already, takes 
them back. You'll you'll be surprised of how much they'll just talk and kind of let that flow, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on how serious, on, on how busy they are. But the most time they're just set back. And most people don't call like that. Most people are calling to blow past them. So I, this is all about being different. Take the time to get to know them and consider them, asking how their day. They're humans. They have feelings too, right? And they're going to help you get what you need. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then make sure that when you're ready to ask for the next step, whether that's getting more information about what you're working for or talking to someone else is if they can help you out. People genuinely like to help you out. Okay. And say, Hey, I was, I was hoping you can help me. I need a favor from you. Do you mind? Make sure you ask that question because by the time they say yes, that is actually consent. And by mm -hmm. the time people say yes the first time psychologically, they're going to want to follow through for you, even if they know that it's just passing you over to someone else. Or they'll just tell you that's not the person you want to talk to. You want to talk to this person over here. And thank you for that. Okay? So that's just on the phone some s simple ways of getting to know them, befriend them, build an advocate with the gatekeeper. Okay? Um, and then – and for those of you that have a little bit more um, capital to invest into something, I really, really suggest that you deliver some sort of food or treats to the gatekeeper. Especially if they've called a bunch of times, they haven't been able to help you do that. Um, the theory of reciprocity is that how many times does the gatekeeper get something? They're usually handing gifts that was meant for someone else to that person and they rarely get things so it's for so them to true. get something they're going to feel a lot special and they're going to want to do anything and everything to help you so true yeah. well you haven't forgotten what it's like if you gave that answer in my opinion giovanni and <laughs> the most people ask how to get past them and i love your mindset of framing it that you, you don't have to you know, build a relationship with them. They're the arbiter. Yeah. And I think I agree with, you know, that so many people forget they're humans and they're not an obstacle. They're not a hurdle in your, in your uh, hundred meter race to leap over They're They're humans and they can actually be your worst enemy. If you try to just burn them or get around them or mislead them, in my opinion, uh, in my experience, unfortunately, and, or they can be your best friend, your best helper. Um, uh, and so few people take the time to do it right, I feel like. Yeah, exactly this. And here's another thing for – this is just general advice for those of you that are hiring outsourced telemarketing companies or doing these kinds of things or whether you're doing that yourself. And I'm not here to say that cold call telemarketing is a bad thing. I just want you to be aware of what it is that you are doing, okay? There is only a finite amount of customers in your service area. And I know mm -hmm. nowadays we can expand, you know, nationally and we can service customers remotely, but always think of an inside out approach. If you're making a large number of dials, okay, over and over and over again, using some of these softwares to help you do it or another person's doing it on your behalf, you sometimes only look at the appointment you get. You're not realizing how many companies you've annoyed or burned mm -hmm. on the way to that appointment. Mm -hmm. In that honeymoon phase, has a short life cycle mm -hmm. where you're going to be figuring around and then you're going to figure out you're going to want a way to address your marketing later or reapproach your brand and your brand's going to have some of that tarnish on it. You know what I mean? So um, I'm a big believer in quality over quantity. You know, do everything you can to a smaller group of people to make sure they have a one of a kind experience with you and that that experience is a pleasant one regardless of what your activity type is. Mm. And that way, it's a longer journey towards critical mass, but it's one where your company won't suffer the consequences of it later and hit a major roadblock where it's harder to scale. Mm. Well said. I uh, wanted to take a, a comment related to that. Anthony's asking regarding the food and treats. So, so listening, leaning in, but post-COVID, People were, were very wary of accepting ed edible items and maybe anything. Um, any any thoughts or suggestions on that? Yeah, it doesn't always have to be uh, food or treats. I, I find that that's still an individual thing, and you can work with companies that uh, take have taken COVID into measures where they individually wrap treats. They don't just give you an open box of cookies anymore. There's a company called Brownie Points that distributes nationwide. 
gourmet handmade brownies that do little bites and they're individually wrapped. Um, so those kinds of things are still good and they kind of cover the COVID policy. But even if you didn't want to do things like treats or anything else, um, you can think of um, anything, okay? Flowers are good. Um, uh, little technology gifts that you can do for people. It kind of depends on what your overall budget is. You know what I mean? Um, and that's a whole nother conversation, but I'm a type of person. If you guys look up glass hive and look up our, our gift of technology boxes. Okay. That, that we have some people posted about them. I think, uh, uh, Jason Beal over at Barracuda posted him on uh, unboxing this whole thing. I try to look at the overall, Life site, lifetime value of a customer. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's, it's a 20 user environment, right? You're looking at 2,500, three grand a month, man of services. And your profit margin should be around 50% or greater. But if you're there, then you're understanding that you're making $15,000 per year. Mm -hmm. And if you just do a normal term contract, it's $45,000. And if you keep them forever, it can be $450,000. Key thing is, what would you spend to get that? Mm -hmm. I believe, you know, you have to have a client experience budget appropriate for that level of contract you're going to obtain. Don't just spend $5,000 to mass mail a thousand businesses. Spend $5,000 to do a mind blowing thing for 10 businesses and convert 30% of those. And that will pay for everything. I love so that. that's just the mindset, man. It's, 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 Stand aside and create a one-of-a-kind experience. Disney does this the best, okay? They're having their issues now, but when you go into Disneyland or Disney World, you're transported to another world. Mm -hmm. And pulleys don't work there. They're, they have cast. That's it's right. their cast. And there's castles and magic and, and all kinds of things to immerse you in a one-of-a-kind experience. That's why their cruises have dominated since they landed. They're the number one rated cruise in the world um, but they spare no expense of keeping the customer experience at the forefront of everything they do and you got to think of it in that way in your own way what kind of magic can you create for those you come in contact with okay yeah and start with a smaller concentrated group higher value i always try to give 10 times more value out than i expect to get back that's kind of a mindset i have even when i'm drafting an email i love that 10x mindset um yeah. So I wanted to, to switch gears for a second and take a question, uh, another question from uh, another uh, from somebody else. Chris Savage asks, ultimately, IT services are a commodity product, except when the MSP has strength in specific tech, SAP, AWS or industries, fintech, media, healthcare, etc. Which technologies or markets do you see being underserved in the MSP market is, is Chris's question. Very good question. I think it's going to lead into a whole can of worms, Chris. So I hope you're you're ready for this. Okay. <laughs> I I I I I I almost I dislike very much. If I can use the word hate. I dislike very much the, the commodity thing, and I know that's kind of a reality, right? Um, that IT services are looked at as a commodity. However, we've allowed ourselves to lean more into the commodity mindset because as long as I've been in the channel, they've been trying to tell me I'm leaving, I'm going out of business and everything's going to be a commodity in five years. It, it, you're, you're done right from the time of when you're building, you know, uh, you're a system mm -hmm. builder. You got to start building systems. You got building systems. You're not going to be in business. And then the OEMs come out, stop building systems, have a bench. You need to have a break fix bench. And if you don't have a bench for your servicing and repairing computers, you're not going to be in business. Networking comes out. You're not doing networking projects, not installing networks to your clients' environments. You're not going to be in business. You're not rolling a truck. Oh, and then break fix. You're still doing break fix, not managed services. You're rolling trucks out there. You should be doing flat rate. Oh my gosh, you're doing flat rate, but you're not doing the cloud. You still have on-premise technology. If you just have on-premise knowledge, you're going to go away. Every five years, you should be extinct. And we're yeah. left with this this hybrid and you, and you monster. Left out, you left out cloud, cybersecurity, right? right. Cloud, All the things are supposed yeah, to cybersecurity, kill you that's the thing. You're not an MSSP? How dare you? Just wait. Wait to see what happens because if you're not an MSSP, we're just going to take out all the MSPs. <laughs> okay? We got more stuff coming out the way, by the way. Get ready for hyper automation, you know? And if you think building a sock, you know, I, had to, I had to teach you how to build knocks back in the day. Now you have to build a sock. 
and get ready to build a rock. There's a robotic operations center, and there's a whole thing I can get into a whole podcast just about that. Okay, the reality is, is we have the un, we have the burden of taking this ever growing landscape, understanding how to be skilled in different parts of it to provide answers for our customers to help them going. Which is to your question, right? Like, how do you lean in? What are the underserved markets? I don't. I. I there. There are always going to be verticals that are really good uh, for you, you know. And I think some of the ones that people don't talk about a lot are are architects. Architects um, have a lot of of unique needs in their environment uh, because they have these high intense graphic uh, file sizes and applications and so many different things that they're doing. Um, you know, they're still using a lot of different uh, peripherals. Wacom tablets, Cintiqs, iPad Pros now, and they have the, the Microsoft Surface Studios where they're drawing on it and they're putting it up to do computing. Um, and they have unique backup requirements, compliance, they're deadline driven, all the same. And they, they have a really good margin on what it is that they do. But aside from going into those markets, okay, the one thing I can tell you to end the commodity question is stop marketing solutions. I know that that's what we always do. Let's do a cybersecurity campaign. Let's do a managed services campaign. Let's do a campaign about the cloud. Let's do a campaign about compliance. That is the one thing that makes you just like everybody else. There's only a finite amount of vendors. We're all partnered with the same vendors, doing the same thing, offering the exact same solution. Where we are unique is how we deliver those services, our internal processes the investments we made in our infrastructure to support them better than you could ever support themselves. Our people, computers don't reach out and support your customers, your people do, okay? Your philosophy around customer support, that internal jargon, your internal documentation is your best client-facing marketing material you haven't sent out yet. I get people coming to me and asking me to build them so much cybersecurity marketing content with all these amazing statistics on it, and they're gonna send it out. But I've never had a customer come to me and be like, hey, you know what? I have a beautiful knock infrastructure with all these bright gauge dashboards. And look at our escalation process and the way we triage tickets to solve these tickets faster than everybody could. And we have such an incredibly talented team. Can we take a picture of this and turn it into a graphic so I can show the, my customers the investments we made to support their business better than they ever could? Mm -hmm. I've never seen that. Here's another one. I've never seen a campaign or a partner come to me for a campaign to say, Hey, I'm going to go approach businesses that want to have their business acquired within the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give them an approach on how technology can help increase their valuation two or three X so they can maximize the valuation at time of exit. When have we ever heard that? And those are true things, by the way, Small, a medium-sized accounting firm being swallowed by a big one, a big thing that affects their valuation and their multiple is how easy the data can migrate. Mm -hmm. you know, the compliances and all that kind of stuff. And those things you control. Mm -hmm. And they're not seeing that. And I guarantee you if they saw it that way, they would pay you a premium and bring you on as a more of a trusted advisor because all we are here to do is to help them meet their desired business outcomes quickly and more cost-effectively through the use of technology. So think of those things more so than what niche vertical needs more help or what solution can I jump in there that's underserved or things like that. You know, what's more mm -hmm. underserved is you talking about your own philosophy, your own process, your own IP, your differentiators. That's underserved. Well said. Yeah, we've, we've got somebody saying good ideas. We're already doing a day in the life presentation showing how we work with our clients. Um, Wonderful. I got something kind of related I want to bring up that uh, Paul Burbeck asked earlier, uh, maybe related to this, but you brought up how we should be extinct every five years. But his question is, any thoughts on getting spread too thin as an MSP? He said, we've branched into ERP and then CCTV and consultancy plus doing a normal MSP. And then, you know, you, you mentioned you could be brake fix, you could be rolling trucks, you could be service binge, you could be a sock and a knock and a, you know, like, so what? Well, I guess his question is, you know, what are your thoughts on getting spread too thin? Yeah, I think that's a real big problem. You know, uh, jack of all trades, a master of none. That's an old saying. 
right? Um, and it's not like new solutions are not going to stop making their way. We're going to get spread more and more thin and we just can't be everything to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to be an expert. You know, people are going to start going to stop going to the general doctor and they're going to want expertise in certain areas. Um, and where you, do, where you lay your hat into those expertise, I would focus more on outcome related things more than like a specific service provider. So as, as, as an example, I think one of the things you can get really good at is business workflow automation. Um, and that'll set the stage for the future because every business, okay, wants, has a vision of how they ideally want their business to operate. Okay. They, when, when technology was introduced into the business landscape, it was very limited. So they designed their processes around the limitations of computers, right? Or a network and what they could do. There was mm -hmm. those type of limitations there. And instead of revisiting that vision of how you want your business to operate again, most of us have ended up upgrading it as they've been innovating little by little, which I call building Frankenstein. We took some of the bone colored equipment out, swapped it with black equipment. And then the black equipment was there, and then we put more hard drive space in there. And then we took some stuff out, some that's in the cloud. And, and, and it's like this, and it's this monster. Yet at the core is still the technology at the center and them designing business processes around it. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, considering the amount of peripherals and line of business applications today, we can challenge our clients to reimagine their business and say, look, tell them that story. This is how we've been running and this is how you design your processes. But I want you to tell me how you want your business, how you envision your business running, what the idea of the perfect business symphony or business process is for you. And now I can design a technology infrastructure around that to support that and to secure, you know, um, your business in unique ways and make sure that it's automated, make sure that it's efficient and make sure that it's flexible. So during this new era where people are working remotely and at the office, it can be accessible safely from whatever locations. I think if you understood how to help businesses automate or challenge them on how they can automate their business operations, then the technology you recommend to do that is that's just going to be the layup for you. You know what I mean? So get real into the process of customer acquisition all the way through quote, all the way through service delivery uh, for your customers. And that's going to require you to be a little bit vertical specific. If you don't, if you don't have want to be too, too vertical specific, you can stick with professional services companies like law firms, um, real estate agents, accounting firms, um, architects, those kinds of things, marketing agencies, they have a similar-ish, right, kind of uh, uh, process and, and the way they earn customers and so forth. So you can stick in that gamut. But again, um, help them, you know, understand how to automate their business processes, do more with less, spend smarter, you know, double down on the capital around their technology as opposed to just putting another body uh, to solve a remedial problem. Yeah, uh, I can, I can totally relate to that. Always want to do more. Oh, you know, I don't care if you're in technology. I don't care if you are an MSP. You still want to do more. You want your business to perform better, right? So, um, yeah. So th I want to hit you with one of the hard questions we got, which is, how do I differentiate? Uh, we were talking earlier, there's an MSP I was talking to. It's like, there's 275 of us in the metro area. We all say about the same thing. So mm -hmm. that's the question I often get is how do I, how do I even start to differentiate? Cause like you said, we're, there's only a limited number of vendors. You know, it's not, it's not based on the, you're a Microsoft partner or a Cisco partner or whatever. Right. So w what do you say to that, Giovanni? Yeah. Um, yeah, so starting the differentiation is, again, it's going to have to be a look within, okay? Remember that the things that make you different is your philosophy of customer support, the investments you made in your infrastructure, your people, your process, your documentations. All those things are unique differentiators, okay? 
So you're going to have to learn how to start marketing them. Some real quick tips. Do not use stock photography in your marketing. Okay. Have a photographer come in. It's not a lot of money. You can get a good photographer to come in for 500 bucks or so and take some really good candid shots of your environment so that you can at first and foremost, give them a glimpse of the human beings that are invested into them and the infrastructure that you have to support their environment better than they ever could. Some of you have beautiful, beautiful network operation centers uh, and displays and all kinds of really cool, unique processes of how your, um, you, you manage tickets and manage the escalation, the triage and everything else. Um, all the documentation you use, your checklist for even how you test backups, uh, for how you procure and provision technology, for how you write um, cybersecurity policies for the users and what they can and can't do. A lot of that's internal and maybe not sexy spreadsheets, but if you start to share that clientele, they're gonna, if you can share that with your customers, they're gonna understand they're investing in a business that has just countless hours of experience in IP and has their stuff together. They're gonna wanna see those documents. And like, my gosh, look at all these things you have in place to make sure that you're like, yes, I'm looking at everything all the time. I've been doing this for a long time. A smaller company that has one or two people that may be underpricing you does not have, you know, uh, all this IP and all this experience, and all this documentation, to keep things from falling through the cracks. Okay. So I would really focus on that. Another thing too, is your culture. Um, here's something that's good. Try this, for example, and you're going to see an immediate jump in your business. This is super different. And this advice I'm going to give you, everybody can do it and it'll still, everybody, it'll come out different. Your company newsletter, stop talking about like technology or your solutions or some blog about cybersecurity. Don't include any of that in the newsletter. Include your personal hobbies. Okay. Whether if that's cooking, then start sharing cooking recipes and pictures and videos of you cooking. If that's building arcade cabinets all the time, woodworking, golf, whatever it is, put that out there. You can do clever tie-ins, right? If you're, if you're, I have a, a customer that was really good uh, chef. She's just amazing. And she uses a bunch of little technology devices to help make her cooking more efficient because she's a, the, the owner of a business. But if you start doing that, you're going to connect with people that share your interests. And then when they realize what you do and you connect over that, you're going to have an in to talk to them and they're going to like you better because they can see themselves as having, you know, not just this IT nerd that can do these different things, but another person with similar interests that just so happens to take care of a portion of the business I'm not so good at. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're really into sports, whatever it is, put your entire newsletter about that. I know it's going to be scary. You're going to be like, this is weird. I'm not talking about the business. Just trust me. It's going to be amazing. So to kind of summarize it for the layman, me, right? Yeah. Then quit talking about the same things we're all talking about, which is some stat about cybersecurity or percent likelihood of your business going out of business or data loss or what have you. And yeah. On the business side, it sounds like you said, take your internal policies, documentation, all those, and, and show them as why your business is different. And then on the marketing side, talk about you as a human. Mm -hmm. Because people want to do business with humans, not just, I guess, to use your word, stock photography and uh, and, and people that are just uh, tech nerds, um, right? Uh, so is this is this because the more technology we get, the further we're we seem disconnected, even though we can be connected faster and more deeply than we could. Um, what's your take on that, Giovanni? Yeah, I mean, you know, part like if you notice social media and I have my own personal views on social media, I'm not a big social media person. You know, I use LinkedIn probably more than anything else. I don't really have accounts with any other of the, of the tools, but uh, people are connected more than ever, and people have a lot of time on their personal devices where they're just browsing through things. Even the algorithms are getting really, really good at showing you stuff you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And most of that stuff, I can promise you, because if they were IT-related things, they wouldn't need you. 
right? They're already interested in that kind of stuff. So they're gonna, they always seem to connect digitally over things that their common personal interests. So that's going to be your avenue to introduce yourself and what it is that you do. Okay. Um, so there's that element of it when it comes to, to, to marketing that, but the other things are going to be kind of like a, like a, think of this as like a behind the scenes. Okay. Where, you know, I heard from one of the users before you're kind of doing a day in a life, but you need to express with great detail something like how you do, how you designed your network operating, uh, network operation center and why you designed it that way and how you handle ticket es escalation. Just do that, like as, as a way of, this is our process and this is how our company solves issues for customers. This is how we ensure that they are not breached or that they have optimal uptime. The level of just looking at something like that and the exhaustive detail by which you can speak it just invokes trust. They're like, my goodness, look at that. Look at all that goes into that, I didn't even know, you know? Yeah. and it's so, so much harder for an incumbent to come in and market exactly the same thing. You know, they may have their own way of doing it. You know, they may have a, a fancy, not, not so good process. Um, some of them may use more automation, less people, you know, those kinds of things, but people are going to connect over that because what a business owner or a key executive in a business is going to appreciate making an investment in their business. You're seeing how you make investments in your business and all the effort you put designing process and they're look, taking a look at themselves. They're like, yeah, I know it, man. I'm over here making these investments or trying to make these hires and trying to make our infrastructure more scalable. And from a business perspective, they'll relate to that and they'll be interested in it and they'll see that as a reflection of, okay, this person's intense about their processes and their their operation as I am in my own business. Hmm. So I'm going to put you in the hot seat as we get ready to wrap up here, Giovanni, because I've gotten sure. a lot out of today. And the question is, what are the top three takeaways? If I'm just getting started, I'm trying to differentiate. You, you, you've told us in long form, give me the short form. Like, what do I need to do? I'm trying to leave this episode and take action. What, what do you say? Okay. Stop marketing your solutions, okay? The solutions you sell and start marketing your processes, inter internal documentation, culture, and client philosophy, okay? Number one. Number two, I would say focus a lot more on workflow automation. Just a statistic for you guys is good. Keyword search volume nationwide for uh, IT support is roughly 25,000, 30,000 is what they search, managed services, something like that. Workflow automation is searched half a million times. Mm. So that just gives you an idea of that kind of quantity. So I would focus more, and that's because it's a direct business problem, it's not a technology problem. Okay, so focus more on workflow automation. You're going to get that. And thirdly, again, focus on making relationships with everybody you come across. Don't try to blow past anybody in any of these organizations that you're trying to earn their business with. Starting from the gatekeeper, create a unique experience, give them something wild, give them something to remember you, and don't do a blanket approach. Start small and do as much as you can within that small group and expand it as your ROI grows. Okay. And if you do those things, you're going to find yourself converting a lot more business and selling a lot more too. That's an awesome way. Now I've got, now I've got a whole bunch of things I've got to do now. Um, that was <laughs> amazing, Giovanni. I, I learned a lot. Um, you know, the comments keep pouring in more than we have time to get to. Um, but I, I want to thank you for being here, giving the gift of your time and, and just tons of experience with 386,000 leads, 1.2 billion in, uh, in driven revenue driven MSPs and just, I don't know, colorful life. So, um, how can people find you? How can they connect to you? How can they get your help? Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to connect and, and, and communicate through there. Uh, 
other ways to get in touch if you guys want to participate with Glass Hive and, and see the resources that we have available for you here. Feel free to go to glasshive.com and create a free account. Um, and in Browse, we have thousands of marketing materials that are AI automatically designed for you that you can leverage um, that'll help you get your foot in the door and get you started. Awesome. Awesome. So tons and tons of comments come coming through that we didn't really get to all of them. Um, and, uh, so, um, I do, if, if you have a minute, uh, can we do one more just for the fun of it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I got okay. time. Go for it. Um, so Dustin wants to know how do you bridge the gap with marketing that's focused on hobbies? Cause you were giving a really great tip there, but that may show up in someone's social feed to having a conversation about services. So, I suppose what you mean, right, Dustin, is if I'm into cooking or hiking, how do I how do I translate that into? But I can also help you with managed okay. IT. Okay, I've done a couple of these in the past, right? So um, one customer was from Boston, and he's really really into football. So during football season, that was the whole. Thing. And the Patriots, of course, made it to the Super Bowl. So we wanted to throw in a unified communications angle. They were selling unified communications and VoIP. So we were like, how the Patriots are going to use unified communications to win the Super Bowl. And we took analogies from like, you know, guys, we always know we talk about football. You know, my expertise is in technology. And I'm going to go ahead and explain to you, you know, how they're leveraging technology to communicate to get the cutting edge. You have the coach and the, the, the quarterback has a radio and a helmet. You have the coach on the sideline that has a head that has a headpiece on that's radioing in and communicating with the quarterback. Quarterback has the only way they communicate with the team and the ways they're looking at plays. You have the Microsoft Surface Studio uh, Surface tablets, you know, uh, on the sidelines, and then you got someone in the overhead booth that's oftentimes offensive coordinator that's radioing into the head coach that's reading defenses and doing all kinds of things. They're literally using technology drawing up plays on the flies and audibles and adjustments and communicating that on and off the field from inside a booth to the office to the sideline to the actual player in the middle of the game, you know? And that was a real cool way of driving that parity of how critical communication, the ability to pass over rich media files in a quick way, whether it's you're just trying to sell someone off of exchange and adopting into office 365 because teams has, gives you that ability to communicate like that. Right. Mm -hmm is an easy tie-in that's that's one you know uh the cooking example one was a lot of like you know she she was talking about a recipe she was making one of the th cover stories on the on the newsletter was a recipe and she's like look you know i run a business i'm an it expert so you know it what we do for our customers is help them save tons of time at work by automating things and leveraging technology making things more efficient i do the same thing when i'm cooking Cause I'm running a business. So, you know, I, she has, um, these digital scales that, uh, are, 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 you know, weighing all the food and all the different portions. Um, some of her appliances are smart. So she has the ability when she's doing something else, um, she can stop or start the oven remotely. Cause like with the internet of things, that's all a big kind of thing now where, um, you can control those appliances with your mobile device. So those are the kinds of things. And when you talk about the internet of things, we talk about, again, a correlation back at the office of how you can control all that kind of stuff. So those are just examples of how we use these personal interests in getting it going. Uh, even in the cooking one, and just come back to me now too, she was talking about a plan. She's like, you know, for all of my customers that I have, we have to have a backup and disaster recovery plan a literal documented plan of what happens in case of a disaster, if the building's compromised, in case of server outage, there's all these steps we need to do. And in order for me to get through cooking these elaborate meals, I need to have a plan ahead of time of what we're going to do or if I need a hand prepping the vegetables or prepping everything so I can make this feast, this is how we do it. So they approach life as they approach business and your customers do the same thing. And you could always uh, tie in, sprinkle your technology and your services in there. And the more they watch, the more they like you, the more naturally those opportunities will present themselves for you to actually have a, a business conversation to win them as a customer. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, this, this is an amazing gift. I see more comments coming and we'll get to as many as we can in the discussion. Uh, thank you so much for your time guys. If you're listening, uh, we've already put, put up the glass hive URL and here's LinkedIn for, to connect directly to Giovanni. So reach out and get his help, uh, get his software, get, get any, get anything you can he, This guy knows his stuff. Thank you so much for being here, Giovanni. I learned so much from you today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, guys, if you enjoyed this, uh, we are live every two weeks at 2 Eastern. So August 31st, mark your calendar. We have Adam Slutskin, president and co-founder of CyberFox. And we're going to talk about going from the four-letter word fear to fortune. So uh, mark your calendars. You're not going to want to miss that. Guys, if you want to make sure you don't miss anything, follow us on your favorite socials or head over to mspmindset.com slash news uh, so that you can register and get notified via this old fashioned thing called email. If you'd like the, uh, the, the, the socials, we're MSP Mindset on all the uh, socials. So make sure to connect with us and share um, so that you are aware of all the coolest guests that we have uh, coming up. Thank you so much. It was a privilege to be able to um, interview uh, uh, such an amazing person as Giovanni today and to have your time and attention. We will see you here live in two weeks.